All right, so first of all, um, I want to thank you a lot for doing this for us, Ron. This is fantastic to be able to hear from you on this topic. Um, now, Mr. Krull obviously struck around Melbourne in the, uh, the late 1980s and the early 1990s. In terms of um, crime and things like that, what was Melbourne like around that time, particularly? Um, in oh, the I think, uh, Melbourne, uh, say, 1988 uh, to 1992, um, it probably wasn't 24-7 uh, like it is now. Yes, you had nightclubs and stuff, but they would basically finish at like one o'clock in the morning. Um, we had um, probably significant crime in relation to armed robberies, uh, particularly around uh, financial institutions, but they, as security increased, they dropped off. Uh, police predominantly um, worked three shifts, seven till three, three to 11, and uh, night shift, and there was often a saying, um, I think for night shift, the only people are out are crooks and coppers. Uh, Melbourne's population uh, was growing. Um, most hotels back then uh, had to close by uh, 10 o'clock at night. And in 1988, um, we didn't have mobile phones, you know, they were just starting by about 1989. So, you know, it was probably a different uh, environment. Was there much of a precedent for cases like this? Uh, there'd been, um, we'd had a situation where we had a cat burglar who uh, had gone around the wealthy suburb of Turak, South Yarra, um, climbed up uh, pipes and drains, uh, predominantly stole a lot of jewellery, but occasionally uh, raped people uh, or women, but of a, uh, a later age. This was probably the first time where it was picked up that there was a series of young girls who had been abducted or either raped in their home. Now, some say Mr. Krill went back as far as 1985 and operated up until about um, 1992. Uh, and there were similarities in some of those early ones, but I think there's probably four significant ones from 1988 through to uh, 1991. When it became apparent there was a serial um, child abductor and child abuser in Melbourne, what was the, the sort of the feeling or the mood that was created both in the community and throughout law enforcement? Uh, firstly, in the community, there was a sense of uh, apprehension. These were all uh, young girls who uh, were asleep in their bed. Uh, and the perpetrator always uh, broke into the house, wore a black balaclava. So there were people in the community. I think um, the attacks were probably getting shorter in the gap length of time. So you could say uh, they were escalating. Uh, the very first one, uh, he didn't take the uh, victim from the home. And then later on, he was taking them from the home. And, and the last one in 91 was ultimately found um, dead. So there was uh, angst within the community. And I think within law enforcement, uh, a lot of pressure then to uh, to try to bring this to some resolution and apprehend the person responsible. So, Ron, what was your personal experience with the Mr. Cruel case? How much work did you do on it? So, my own experience was only later on, um, probably not until nearly 2000, when it became what we know as a cold case. I was uh, working at the Homicide Squad uh, at the time in uh, 1988, 1989, when it started. Uh, and a lot of the people that I worked with, um, David Sprague, who became the inspector and probably headed the investigation of uh, Mr. Krull, uh, whilst he didn't work on it individually from time to time, we gave them assistance. And then it wasn't until later on in 2000 that I had to go back over the file and to see if there were any other avenues um, to follow. So did the profile of Mr. Krull develop at all between the original Operation Spectrum and when you jumped on the cold case? No, there was a profile done by a criminal profiler, uh, basically talking about that this uh, offender was probably someone between uh, 35 and 40, uh, someone who actually was dedicated or like children, uh, most of these, uh, or the four significant uh, attacks, all took place during school holidays. So there was a question of, is this person on leave from a school? Um, 
they thought that um, he fitted well into the community uh, and he had a, basically a second life and no one would know anything about him unless you were able to say, well, he was out on a particular night. So I don't think, um, I don't think the profile uh, really changed. The question is how accurate is it? Well, let's sort of look into Mr. Krull's MO a little bit here. Um, we know of at least one of the cases, I think Sharon Wills was the name of one of the victims. Uh, when Mr. Krull broke into her house, he called her out by name. And I think that raised questions of whether he, what, what sort of motivated him, if he had a particular agenda against the family or if the victims were just objects of desire. Do you think there was any particular motivation that he had or is it hard to tell? Um, I think, well, quite clearly the motivation is sexual uh, because all the girls were sexually uh, assaulted. Um, Sharon Wills was taken from her home in Ringwood and he held her for approximately 18 hours. Um, yes, he did use her name, but I think, um, I don't think there's any connection between Sharon Wills and the other families. And sometimes these people take uh, or do a lot of uh, background work, surveillance and that before they uh, make their move because they want to be able to get into the house um, easily. They might say to a neighbour, oh, who's the young girl down there? And innocently they say, oh, well, that's Sharon. So I think there was always a lot of planning done uh, and he knew where to go and he knew how to get out of the house. Uh, and I think there are similarities. Um, the location that he took at least one of or two of them to, they described the bedroom, uh, I mean the bathroom as the basin being very close to the toilet. And in the lounge room, he had a chunky um, pine um, uh, lounge suite. So uh, I think there was just a lot of planning uh, going into it. He, I think he threw, or he tried at least to throw police off a number of times with red herrings. Was that a deliberate ploy or do you think that just sort of happened um, by chance as his MO changed a little bit between the various victims? Oh, because there was so much um, publicity, sometimes uh, if you look at the Golden Gate Killer in uh, California, he was involved in something like 56 um, serious sexual assaults and, and murders. Over time, his, his MO changed. Uh, and he was always trying to be one step ahead of the police. So I think when there's a lot of publicity, uh, if it indicated that it might be pointing in your direction, you would probably change it. Do you think you may have had some sort of involvement with um, police in an occupational fashion before this, or is it just a switched on individual who knew how they worked? Uh, quite clearly, he knew a lot about um, forensics um, because very little uh, forensic material uh, has been, um, I guess, located in, uh, which we were able to then um, draw a connection if you had a profile. Um, no, I think he was, uh, no, I don't, I don't think he did from other information that I had. Let's move on to um, the Carmen Chan attack in 1991, because that was obviously very different from the other three and that it ended in a murder. Do you believe because there's some speculation that it wasn't actually Mr. Cruel who murdered Carmen Chan. What do you think? Um, I think it, it is the same person. Um, questions are asked uh, as to why he would go to the next level. Uh, sometimes uh, maybe Carmen uh, Chan identified him. Um, you know, there were, th you know, probably a thousand persons of interest in the original file. So you looked at all different um, sex offenders and a whole range of different people. But um, maybe around 2000, 2001, uh, a man who was a well-known criminal who was dying of cancer and I'd been to see him about another matter. And I walked out to the police car and then he said yeah. to me, come back in Ron I'm dying and he sat down and he told me who he believed Mr. Cruel was and Mr. Cruel was somebody who frequented Carmen Chan's mum and dad's restaurant so if that part's right then uh, she might have identified him 
did you have any more leads or anything to go on after you received that information or was it a bit of a case of not being able to do anything with it? Well, well, quite clearly, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Um, so you have an attack in 87, you have an attack in 88, you have an attack in 90, and then you have Carmen Chan in 91. The question always that's been posed is, what happened to him? Okay, is he in prison? Has he gone overseas? Has he died? Because you can see an escalation in those four different types of offences. But when this um, well-known criminal told me who was responsible, he said, but I'll tell you, that well-known criminal has died. Now, I went back and checked and he um, died in 1992. Now, he lived in Altham at the time in uh, a particular street. And the person who was telling me had been to that house and he said, the garage had been converted into a bedroom and bathroom identical to what was shown in pictures that one of the girls had drawn. Um, I passed the information on to uh, other police and I'm not sure where it went to. Aside from that, which is obviously a pretty massive thing, were there any other aspects of the cases that came up during your work that seemed pretty interesting, but, um, that you weren't really, that didn't really hadn't divulged at any point, like anything that stuck out to you? Oh, look, you know, um, that was a massive uh, investigation. And I think at times when investigations go on for years and years, um, there are times when things can be missed. So someone has to sit above that information. But I think if you look at an investigation that might go for 10 years, it's about continuity. Is there somebody who was in the original investigation who has been there all along? Otherwise, it's a matter of, uh, of reading. Now, when you have a suspect, I call them a person of interest. So someone might pick up the phone and say, I know, I know or I think who's responsible for Carmen Chan and his name's Bill Smith. Now, you can go and see Bill Smith and it's 15 years on and he says, well, it's not me. Well, where were you on particular day? Well, I can't tell you what I had for breakfast. Unless you can find some connection to, say, Carmen Chan, there's not a lot that you can do. So you always try to eliminate every uh, person of interest and suspect so that you don't go back over uh, the file. But I could say, as I sit here now, there are probably uh, pieces of information that still haven't been looked at because it's now a classified as a cold case and it probably won't be looked at again unless there's new information. So what's the, um, the differentiation with a cold case there? Because that'll be good to know for the people watching this. Does that determine, um, well, classifying something as a cold case, does that change the police, um, how they work towards it? So, yes, it does. So with Calm and Chan, they set up a particular task force where they drew um, experienced detectives together, had a lot of analytical support, and that may have run for at least two to three years. And then the, um, the hierarchy of Victoria Police have to make a decision and say, well, no, what we now propose to do is we'll sit that uh, back at sex crimes, right? Because three of the offences are sexual. Then at a particular time, um, maybe 2000, 2001, the task force spectrum, which well, that's what it was called, came to homicide and sat under the homicide squad cold case because of the death of Carmen Chan. So normally, so we're talking about a homicide, if you have exhausted all the inquiries that you can do and you've had an inquest into the death and the coroner makes a determination and says that Carmen Chan um, died on or about a particular date and uh, we believe um, she was murdered then it becomes a cold case once it's been to an inquest in relation to sexual offences you're probably looking at four or five years all the leads have dried up and that would then become a cold case within uh, the sexual offences squad all right so just want to, wanted to bring it back to the um this gentleman who you received information about in the later years who lived in eltham 
did he match the profile that was originally put out in 1991? Uh, of age, yes. Um, he, I would, of age, yes, he was in, in, the, in the right age bracket. Um, he was somebody who was well known to police, somebody who from time to time uh, cross-dressed and at the time, he, this is the suspect, was living in Eltham. And, and the person who uh, was a well-known criminal who, he didn't have to tell me, right? So you've got a situation, I've been to see him about another matter. And I'm getting in the car to drive away. And he came out and he said, Ron, I've got to tell you something. I'm dying and oh, you've always treated me fairly. And I want to tell you uh, who Mr. Cruel is. And we went back inside and I spent the next half an hour with him. Now, some people say, well, that can be bullshit. I don't think so. Because when I start to check in 1992, that person is no longer with us. He was living in the area at the time. So the first attack is 1988, uh, Lower Plenty, not far away. Then you have Ringwood. They're still all eastern suburbs, Nicky, Linus, Campbell, and of course, Carmen Chan again back in Lower Plenty. And he was going to that restaurant. I know his photo was shown to um, Carmen Chan's mum and the father, but they couldn't identify him. There was talk, or well, not necessarily talk, but it was mentioned in that profile that was produced by, I think it was the FBI working with the Spectrum detectives that there was every chance that he worked at a school or somewhere he worked with children a lot. Was there any, do you know if this gentleman worked there as well or did similar things? No, he wasn't somebody who he, uh, ran his own business, which he was very successful in. Um, there was another suspect who uh, resided in Carlton. He was a lecturer uh, at a university. Um, and it was a lot of work, um, a lot of work uh, done in relation to uh, that person. Uh, he could fit the profile. He was often with um, children, had school holidays off. Um, his house was searched in Carlton and there were certain, certain items found in the roof of the house, but I don't think they became evidentiary. So Ron, when you first started working on the Mr. Cruel case, how did you approach it? Well, you've got um, thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of information. There was a review done, um, one or two reviews. So it's about going through and reading that uh, review. And then it's about, I guess, has everything been done? And now when you, so you had a system whereby if someone rang Crime Stoppers, you create an information report. That information report is sent to you electronically and then it needs to be actioned, right? Now, sometimes there was more information coming in than what you had resources to do. So when I took it over, there was oh, several, uh, there would have been at least 300 information sheets or information reports which hadn't been actioned. So it was about going back and working through all those to get to the point where you had nothing left. So my, my role really wasn't to go back and reinvestigate. It was to continue on and look at any new information that came in, but bearing in mind, uh, there had been a very strong suspect who was uh, this lecturer at a university. If you had been on the case originally from the get-go, do you think you would have approached it differently to how it was worked? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think um, we're all taught um, the same way. People talk about modern technology and uh, DNA and all sorts of things. Yes, DNA is an investigative tool. It's either inculpatory or exculpatory. In other words, you can use it to eliminate someone but if you've got a positive result, you probably still need some other uh, evidence. So it's about, I guess, having a system whereby um, each address becomes a crime scene. You examine the crime scene. You talk to your witnesses. You've then got to methodically uh, record everything. As information comes in, uh, 
you send your detectives out, you have regular meetings. Uh, in early stages, you're probably having a meeting every couple of days and saying, well, this is what we've achieved. This is where we're at. Uh, this is the path that I think we should go down. And within our task force, you could have 10 reasonable um, suspects. So you break your team down so that everyone of those 10 suspects has been looked at until you can either eliminate them uh, out of the inquiry. Uh, I've done some very, very big inquiries and I probably wouldn't have done it uh, any differently. Do you, think, uh, do you think that he possibly could have been responsible for any other crimes, I think, any other abductions outside the four that are commonly attributed to him? Look, there's some down in um, southern Melbourne, like down around um, Sandringham, Brighton. So I think in total there were 12 um, sexual assaults that were looked at. So historically, so you start with... Um, one in Lower Plenty, which um, the girl is raped in a bed and she's not taken from home. Then the next one is Sharon Wills, which probably put the balloon up. But when they went back historically, they found another eight of similar um, MOs, modus operandi, always wearing a black balaclava. Um, so there's probably 12 that you might attribute to him, but definitely the last four. With the information that you got, um and any other information that's come in. Do you think it's likely that the case will ever be fully solved at this point on? Um, in other words, do you think it's, so in other words, do you think it's likely that more information is going to come in that can put the final nail in the case? What I, what I always say is um, the answer is in the file, right? So if you go back through the file, uh, absolutely the name of the person responsible will be there. Sometimes it's to whether you've missed it or, or circumstances change. And the second part is there is always someone out in the community who knows. And it's an appeal for those people um, to come forward. You know, a young journalist um, approached me in uh, 2010 and said, I want to write a story about this 16 year old girl that was murdered in um, Shepherd in Northern Victoria. And it's never been um, sold. Anyway, she wrote the story. Uh, and eventually I met a man. He said, well, I can tell you who's responsible. It's my uh, brother-in-law. Now it took me another 18 months, but I proved it. So 30 years on, there are people in the community who still hold the key. There's no doubt that uh, the person responsible for this has told someone. It's just about those people coming forward after 42 years policing, but 25 years investigating homicides. I don't think I've ever had a situation where the person responsible hasn't gone and told someone. It's a pretty horrific thing to hold it in. And it's about uh, finding that person or appealing to those, someone who, who knows something to come forward. Just wanted to bring it back to those other cases you were talking about in the southeast of Melbourne that may have possibly been attributed to Mr. Cruel. He had very um, specific um, mannerisms about him, like the sort of the language and the words that he used, um, how meticulous he was with his cleaning of any DNA evidence and his knowledge of knots per se. Do those characteristics carry over to those, um, uh, those other earlier cases or was that just unique to those later four cases? No, I think they're very similar. Um, on one of the occasions for uh, an earlier one, it's um, it's a vacant house which uh, is up for sale. Um, now, there's no forced entry, so how did he get access? And then there were questions about, well, could he be a real estate agent? But the way in which he cleaned up uh, the MO uh, is, is nearly identical. So that's why all those cases were put in, I guess, a basket to say, well, he, he might have started back in 85 and you're looking about, you know, every six, eight months for uh, for an attack. So they were very, very similar. Do you think there was any significance in things such as where the victims were dropped off, the victims who were, um, were returned, of course, such as Sharon and Nicola? For instance, Sharon was dropped off in a public 
public park or a public place and Nicola was left at a power substation. Was there any significance or was that just a matter of convenience for Mr. Krull? Um, other than I think he wanted them to be found. Um, so like uh, Sharon was kept for 18 hours and then I think she was dressed in garbage bags uh, and released and another one near a, a service station. So I think um, early on uh, he didn't he didn't harm he didn't harm them um, other than sexually assault. But I think in the end he wanted them um, to be found. One last thing, Ron. This has been um, a, a fantastic interview so far, and I really appreciate. It. But I have one more question for you, and obviously. I don't expect you to be able to divulge all of the information that you know for, for um, certain reasons, which is fair enough. But how much information exists that can't be divulged about the Mr. Cruel cases? How much is known by the public and how much isn't? Oh, I think some of the journalists who have written stories uh, over the period of time, uh, John Sylvester from The Age, and if you went and uh, did a research, I think the majority of it uh, is out in the public arena. The only bit that's probably not is what I've told you today. So you've got a scoop. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I reckon that covers just about everything. Um, you've been absolutely fantastic, Ron. Thank you so much again for doing this interview for me, mate. It's a pleasure. All the best in your course.